Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today, I share the story of Doug McNish. Doug's a world-class vegan chef, consultant, educator, author, and committed vegan activist. He's been named one of the top five vegan chefs who are revolutionizing food, and he just finished a redesign of his Toronto restaurant mythology. Here's Doug's transformative story. Welcome, Doug. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate you taking the time. Where did you grow up? And kind of give us some background on yourself. I was born in Toronto, so I'm a Toronto boy sort of through and through. And, um, I, uh, I started cooking. Well, I guess I should say I came from a family. Um, my dad was a a lawyer and then he was a judge and my mom was a nurse. So, you know, I was lucky enough to come from an educated household. You know, we didn't, we didn't do things. Um, you know, we, I watched Jeopardy. (laughs) That was sort of my time with my dad was doing Jeopardy and learning the state capital. So I was really lucky to come from a household of, you know, a, a warming household that really, um, you know, I read art books and we took the time to talk about world politics. So I'm really, um, I'm really blessed for that. Um, <clears throat> and I was actually being groomed to be a lawyer. <laughs> I remember being in grade five, grade six, grade seven, and learning what lawyers do and how they act and everything. And and uh, I started cooking. I started cooking when I was 15 years old, and I started working in a British pub and. Um, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the kitchen. I fell in love with the art of creating food and and, and sort of the crazy environment that is um, a restaurant. How did you become a chef? Okay, so you're you're in the uh, in the food service industry at 15, and how do you how do you go from there? Well, <clears throat> I worked in that pub for a couple of years and. Um, you know, it got to a point where, um, and, you know, and the funny thing is, I, 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 it's kind of, I kind of am hesitant to admit this sometimes, but I left high school. I said, you know, mm. high school wasn't for me. The traditional schooling system just wasn't for me. Telling, telling me I had to be somewhere at a certain time, and I had to take this test and do well, or I wouldn't succeed. You know, the the modern traditional schooling system just wasn't for me. And I remember coming to my parents when I was. 17 years old or 18 years old and saying, listen, guys, you know, high school is not working out for me. It doesn't mean I can't be successful or do what I want to do in life, but I want to be a chef. And my mom just said to me, you know, listen, I support you. Wow. We support, we support you, but I want you to go to chef school. You know, I don't want you just to be a cook and that's it. And, and I said, okay. So I wrote an equivalency test for um, one of the chef schools here in Toronto. Uh, shout out to George Brown Chef School. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I went to chef school and I did that for a year. And then I did an apprenticeship um, at a private country club here in Toronto. And it was just sort of a progression from there. I just kept working and working and, and, and moving on and up the ranks and learning. How do you go from, you know, just uh, uh, my impression would be... Um, you know, cooking meat and using dairy and all that to to being vegan. How, how did that change happen? <clears throat> well, you know, it's something that <clears throat> thankfully now um, I know uh, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with some of the chef schools in the last few years of my career. And I know now there's more of an importance placed on vegetarian, vegan, health, nutrition, um, and to a certain extent, well-being. But, you know, 15, 16 years ago, there was none of that. It was like, you stuff a chicken breast with cheese, you dredge it in butter and flour and eggs, and you deep fry it. Mm-hmm. And that's food. And, and you know, you have to work 80 hours a week to be a successful chef. So that sort of was my life. And, and, and my weight ballooned up. Um, and not only my weight, but my, my, my well-being was just was going. Right. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Right. You know, you're, eat, you're eating bad food. You're working too much. You're, you know, the, the chef business definitely back then, um, not as much now, but definitely back then was is work hard, play hard. So you drink a lot of you drink a lot of beer after your shift. Sure. You know, what else do you do when you're 20 something? You, you drink beer and you party with your fellow cooks. 
And uh, it got to a point when I was about 20 or 21 and my weight ballooned up and I just wasn't healthy. And I said, I got to make a change. I really need to make a change in my life. And it was right around then um, I started exercising. Uh, I didn't really change my diet. Um, but I was shown a slaughterhouse video. I was shown Meet Your Meat by PETA. Mm. And um, what I saw you know, would change my life forever. I, uh, you know, I just saw the worst atrocities happening to these animals. And I sort of put two and two together and said, well, I'm cooking these animals. So if I'm cooking these animals, I'm part of the problem. I'm not part of the solution. Right. And at that time, I was actually working on the grill in a steakhouse at the Air Canada Center. So for those of you listening that don't know the Air Canada Center, that's where the Toronto Raptors play. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I was working in the professional sports arena, cooking two to 300 steaks a night, but I decided to stop eating those steaks. Uh. (laughs) Um, And I I didn't go vegan right away. I went vegetarian. Uh Um, I kept a little bit of um, um, like eggs in my diet and cheese, and I wasn't checking ingredients in muffins or cakes or cookies. And um, my life just got better. My life, my health improved. Mm-hmm. Um, I was exercising as well. I was exercising regularly, four or five days a week. And um, the weight started coming off, and I just felt better. And and there was the, the, this sort of joke that I say all the time is, the Leafs didn't make the playoffs that year, but I'm Ching. <laughs> and so I was done at the Air Canada Centre, and uh, <clears throat> I decided to try this vegan thing out. So I think I was 22 years old. And um, I had gone vegan, and uh, know, the rest, they say, sort of is history. I, you know, over the course of a couple of years, I lost about 100 pounds, and I, um, I just changed my entire life around. And my, my, my mind and my wellness and my well-being, just, I went from being a negative, angry person to happy, entrepreneurial mind, go get them, save the world. And... Um, you know, it was tough because I remember that summer when the Leafs didn't make the playoffs, I went back to work at a catering company that I was working at. And for my age, I was making a really good salary, mm-hmm. um, but I was cooking meat and I was responsible. I was the sous chef, essentially, and I was responsible for the money station, which in restaurants, that's commonly referred to as, you know, the meat and the dairy and the animals, right? right. You cook the steaks. And um, I was protesting a lot. I was into animal rights, and I still am, but I was protesting a lot, and, and, uh, but I would come back to my job, and I would cook those animals, and it just didn't feel right. So I, that was my last summer uh, doing it, and I, I still remember the last day I worked in that catering company. I, I think I cleaned 400 racks of lamb, oh. and, and, I, yeah, and I remember leaving, walking home that day, and I had blood and sinew and connective tissue all in my fingernails from these animals. Oh. And I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm never cooking these animals ever again. And that was the last day I did that. And I went and I worked in a vegan cafe here in Toronto. And uh, and my life sort of changed ever since then. So you you said you lost 100 pounds. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I lost I lost a ton of weight. Um, It wasn't just about losing the weight for me. It was it was becoming a different person. I think that people don't understand when they have, you know, all that negativity, all that. I, I believe in energy, and I believe the animals, when they're killed, the fear, go, the fear goes into your body. I, I really, I truly believe that. And, um, you know, if you're walking around with all that negative energy in you, how can you have a great life? How can you achieve what you're meant to achieve in this world? And, you know, losing the weight was fantastic. <laughs> but the thing I didn't realize going into the vegan world is – there's lots of vegan stuff that isn't healthy. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. You can eat Fritos and Oreos, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I had no idea. You know, I remember I remember being in the catering company and talking to one of the chefs, and I said, oh, I'm vegan now. I can eat whatever I want. He said, uh-uh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> um, so I put a bit of weight back on, but, I, you know, I was in my 20s. I was having fun. And, uh, you know, I had fun in that cafe. It wasn't that much of a challenge because I was already – you know, seven, eight years in my career. And it was just a cafe. It was just making salads and sandwiches. And I got, um, I got, uh, a call for a restaurant here in Toronto that was doing raw food and it was raw and cooked. It was all vegan. Mm. 
and it really interested me. I had no experience with raw food at the time, except for, you know, an apple and a salad, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like most of us. Yeah. Um, but I took the job and uh, it was a great experience because I got to really develop my, my vegan uh, cuisine. My, they gave me almost full reign on the menu. And I really got it to learn raw food. And raw food is really cool. I know it can have a bad stigma against it. And it can be, you know, you think about it, it's just cold, bland food. But when it's done properly, it can be phenomenal. And I spent two years in that restaurant. And then I actually got an email for a completely raw restaurant. Really? And I said, yeah. And, you know, it wasn't my style. I am classically trained in French cuisine. I love sauteing deglazing i have no problem with deep frying food um but i said you know let's try and see what happens let's let's see what happens and so i spent almost two years in that restaurant and i really i got full reign again and i really learned the art of raw vegan cuisine and it's like i said it's a cool thing that can be done and i started to get some recognition i started going on local television and i actually got my the contract for my first cookbook there um, so, you know, I got the contract for my first book at 26 by 27, I was writing it Wow! and that was a great experience. Um, and then after that restaurant sort of, I got to a point in my career where I, I had all this information, all this passion, and I just didn't really want to work for anyone anymore. Um, you know, it was just sort of an itch that said, okay, well, I know more than you and I can do better than you. So let's see what happens. And I, I took this leap of faith into entrepreneurship and I didn't know what the hell I was doing at the time, mm-hmm. uh, to be honest. And I was lucky enough to get a consulting job um, for a luxury hotel here in Toronto called the Windsor Arms. And that was in 2011. Um, and I am, I implemented vegan menus um, into every aspect of their food service outlet. So we were doing room service um, and we were doing a vegan Sunday brunch. Wow. And that's sort of where my brunch cuisine started to flourish and shine. You know, we were, it's a steakhouse. It was a, it was called prime at the time and it was a 150 seat restaurant and we were filling it up every Sunday with hungry vegans. Wow. The owner of the hotel and I couldn't believe it. You know, we were busy. Right. So that was, that was a great experience. And then after that I moved on and um, I was promoting my first book that had just come out. And then I took another job, a consulting job at a, a resort called taboo. And that's in Northern Ontario. It's, uh, you know, if we're related to the United States, it's kind of like the Hamptons. Uh-huh. Um, very nice area, uh, a lot of wealth, um, beautiful lakes and scenery. And I worked with a team of 40 to 50 staff there, and I implemented vegan food across all food service outlets. This is 2012 now. It was a great experience. And actually, I, I remember to this day, the chefs told me 30% of all revenue of all sales that season was from the vegan menus. Wow. You know, and that's that's seven years ago. So pretty cool to see that at the time. I got a second cookbook deal. Uh, my first book did very well. It still continues to sell very well. Um, it actually won Best uh, Vegan Cookbook in the World for 2012. Right, right. Uh, it's done very well. And then I, I, I so I got a contract for a second book. Um, you know, I had a bit of an itch to sell food. I wanted to really sort of showcase what I could do. So I took a role at the Evergreen Brickworks Farmer's Market here in Toronto, Mm -hmm. and it's uh, one of the biggest farmer's markets in uh, Canada. Um, Thousands of people come every Saturday. It's just gorgeous. It's a completely green facility, and uh, I was there for five years, uh, actually, and I built, you know, my wife and I actually, I have to give my wife credit. We built that up to do, you know, we were doing a couple thousand dollars a week in sales just at a little farmer's market stall. Wow. And that eventually grew into uh, opening a space called Public Kitchen. It was sort of a continuation of my brand and my career. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did that from 2013 to 2018. Um, so five years and, um, it was a great experience as well. I met so many, I, I sort of joke and say that I went into that first business with a bachelor of food and no business real credentials. And I came out with a master's of food and a bachelor's of business, (laughs) (laughs) you know, it's, I I think it's a good way to explain it. You know, if you don't know how to do, how to do something, throw yourself in and do it. And um, but time, it was time to change again. And 
I was doing these festivals called the Vegandale Food and Drink Festival, and I had done several of them. And it was, you know, literally 10,000 people coming out to do these festivals. And I had an hour and a half line just to try for people to try my food. And I, I connected with the festival owner, um, and his name is Halonik, and we decided to uh, open a restaurant together. And we looked for several months at spaces until we eventually settled on one. And in December of 2017, Mythology Diner opened. Nice. And yeah, so that's sort of my story in a nutshell until until then. So was it uh, Vegan Dale, um, that neighborhood district? Was that in effect then, or was it something that came about later? Uh, it wasn't really in effect then. Um, the restaurant Doomies was next to Mythology, um, so there was already two restaurants, and then there's a there was a lifestyle like clothing store across the street. But um, uh, the team from the Fifty Seven Hundred, which is Hellenic's company, mm -hmm. uh, who, who's my business partner, um, they decided to uh, work on that branding and that coined that sort of term Vegandale. So that that sort of came after. You were working at that uh, Vegandale festival that is now. Um, I know there's, it shows up in New York, Chicago, and a couple other places. Um, mm -hmm. When you were there, were you under your own name, under the, um, the restaurant that you were working at the time? Or? No, it was, it was under my name. Everything, everything I've done um, since 2011 has always been under Doug McNish. So I was doing those festivals as Doug McNish, and um, yeah. So do you still do the Vegan Dale Festival? <laughs> I personally don't. Um, um, in 2015, I was lucky enough to, um, my wife gave birth to a little boy. His name is Ewan. And um, I just decided to make a bit of a change in my life and just be there for him and spend more time um, around him and, and uh you know, you can't do everything. <laughs> I, 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 I hustled for a good decade and, um, it's not that I don't hustle now, but right. it's really, imp it's really important for me to be there, for, you know, as much as I can for him and, you know, pick him up from school and, and, and be there on the weekends. Cause he's only going to be young once, you know, and he gets older, he'll be playing with his friends and going off and he doesn't need that as much. Right. I, uh, I have three girls. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. You understand what I mean. So, um, no, so I don't do the festivals as much, um, but that doesn't mean I don't do them at all. It just means that just not as much. Right now, uh, your wife and son, are they vegan? Yep. My girls are vegan as well. Well, you know, I may have to come to you for advice down the road. My son's only three and a half still. So um, we're lucky enough that he has a daycare that is already vegetarian. Oh, that's great. Um, and I actually worked with the chef years ago. Um, chef Laura is awesome. And she and I worked together, my God, a decade ago. So she knows me and then she knows my son. And it's really just a matter of um, if they're having smoothies, they just give him soy milk or almond milk instead of, instead of cow's milk. And if they're having yogurt, you know, parfaits, they give him coconut milk yogurt instead of dairy yogurt. So it's really hasn't been that big of a change. Um, you know, he says things like, Daddy, they, dr they drink cow's milk. I don't drink cow's milk. And yeah, I think he's starting to, you know, he's, he knows the word vegan and he's start, slowly starting to understand it. Um, but it will be interesting as he gets older to see, you know, how he, how he reacts with it. I've, I've read lots of interviews with kids of parents who are sort of hippies and they're like, oh, my parents were hippies. They just gave me tofu all the time, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but um, so we'll see what happens. But, you know, we're just trying to instill in him the values that we know and believe and think are best for him. And we want him to be a healthy, happy little boy. Yeah, that's a that's a great age. That uh, that's a great age. Three, four, five. That's that's. I guess they're all great ages. Yeah, he's really smiley and fun though. So yeah, you know that's uh yeah it's pretty it's pretty great. That is great. It's it's funny. I say uh, I, I get asked all the time about my career and everything, and I I say, oh, listen, I'm really proud of what I've done. And you know, I was doing some of this stuff 15 years ago. You know, when vegan wasn't even cool. But the the biggest and the best thing that I've ever done in my life and will ever do is be a dad to my son, and I think that is like the most important thing. Yeah, I, I agree. That's that's a very true statement. Um, it's and it's great that you have uh, kind of 
dial back on the um, travel so that you can be there for him. That's uh, that's. I don't think there's anything more important. Yeah. Well, I mean, people are, I think we just have to place our, we have to look at the big picture. We have to place the value on what's impo- most important. And like I said, he's going to be 10 years old and he's going to be going out on the weekends, riding his bike and I can go do festivals and events then, you know, there's, there's lots of time for business. Right. Yeah, there is. You just have to make the right choices now so that, uh, they can, they can kind of get the foundation and start from there. This past January, you were named one of the top five vegan chefs revolutionizing food. Some great company there. Chloe, Miyoko, Tal, Chad, and Derek Sarno. Um, how does that make you feel? That must be uh, like quite an accomplishment. You know, you know, being self-employed, being a chef, it's not always <laughs> rainbows and butterflies. You know, um, you get up and work hard every day. And there's some days where life just kicks your ass, you know, and entrepreneurship is like, you could easily get up and lose $10,000. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's a reality that a lot of people don't understand that there, there's not this safety net of, okay, I'm getting a paycheck and, oh, this is going to be this way. And I'm going to show up for work. And if I don't feel good, I don't have to work that hard. And, you know, that's never been my, even when I was employed by other people, that was never my ethic. That was never my my sort of way I live my life, it was always like, how can I be better each day? And I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a hip hop fan. I have been since I was eight years old and the notorious B.I.G., Biggie Smalls, one of the best rappers ever. And mm-hmm. he says it in one of his songs and he says, you know, they're, they're interviewing him and he, they're like, what's your, what's your secret? Like, how are you so good? And he says, you get up every day and you treat it like it's your first. You get up every day and treat it like it's your first day in a new job. Like you don't know anything and you're ready just to tackle and do well. So going back to winning awards and being called this and that, it, it's, it's, it's a nice feeling. You know, it, it reminds you that all the hard work and all the dedication and all of the sleepless nights, you know, they eventually start to pay off. And, and that, you know, you're not just working for a paycheck. You're not just working to, to keep the lights on, but you're working for a greater cause. And, you know, Derek and, Chad, Derek and Chad Sarno, Chad particularly, I looked up to him for when I was younger. You know, that guy was doing vegan food 20 years ago. Right. And to be named in the, you know, to be named with him and, and Miyoko's cheese. I mean, man, there is the better vegan cheese on the market, in my opinion. You know, to be named in the company of those guys is fantastic. And it just, uh, you know, it makes you feel good. It, it helps the ego, of course, but... <laughs> At the end of the day, you still got to get up and you still got to perform. It's it's akin to an NBA player or a professional sports player in any league. You know, just because you win an award one year doesn't mean you can just sit back and relax now. You know, you still got to get up and work hard and do your best every day. So it's a great feeling um, and it's humbling, but uh, it just pushes me to do even better. Right. Speaking of doing new things and doing better, new cookbook coming out uh, 2020. What can you... Uh Share with us about that. Yeah. So it's actually spring 2020. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, things can change. Um, but I'm lucky enough to be working with Penguin Random House, which is one of the best um, publishing firms in the world, in my opinion. And um, it is going to be a collection of, I hate to say the word comfort food, but, you know, there's going to be things like Salisbury steak. Um, I did a recipe for an Easter ham. Um, a rack of ribs, um, shepherd's pie, uh, chicken wings, calamari, um, you know, definitely, uh, not calorie low food, <laughs> but, um, but you know, a collection of just some awesome kick-ass recipes. There's uh, I was just editing last night and there's a pineapple upside down cake, you know, mm. things like that. So there's, there's going to be lots of great recipes, um, Uh, just over a hundred. And then there's a pantry to it as well. So I've created recipes for like vegan butter and whipped cream and things like that. And, uh, I'm super excited for it. Yeah. It'll be out. It's due to be released in spring of 2020. So just under a year from now. Right. Um, and I will, I'll definitely make my way around and I look forward to visiting, uh, hopefully Boston and, and the East coast and, you know, when I was my second book came out in 2013, I did a bit of a tour. I was in California and 
around. So I, I look forward to visiting those spots again and just meeting people and spreading the gospel of plant-based foods. Nice. Is it going to have that uh, vegan egg in it so, so I can figure out how to make that? <laughs> well, I, you're going to have to wait and find out. Oh, all right. I, what, is, what, is, what is in that? Can you, can you let me in on the secret? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yolk is just um, – it's nutritional yeast, black salt, and sodium alginate. And black salt is just salt that comes from volcanic ash. Uh-huh. So there is sulfur in it. So that's what makes it taste like egg. Uh-huh. Uh, and then sodium alginate is just a natural salt. Uh, it's a gelling agent that comes from seaweed. Oh. Um, and then you make a solution with magnesium chloride, and it's literally just magnesium, which is a mineral. Uh-huh. And you and and the process is actually called spherification. I can't take uh, credit for the process. That was created by this mad scientist chef called Ferran Adria, uh-huh. and, and he had a restaurant called El Bulli in Spain. And uh, he created he created a whole genre call of food called molecular gastronomy. Really, you know, like yeah, like making mayonnaise powder and making popcorn that floated like literally he did these crazy things wow and i learned i learned a little bit of it when i was younger and it's pretty cool it's not my style completely Mm -hmm. um but it's pretty cool some of the things you can do and so the process spherification isn't anything new i just tried to take that into a vegan way um and uh that's sort of how the egg yolk was born i just i look at that and i'm just like wow that looks really that looks fantastic. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, it looks like, it really does look like an egg. I don't know, you know, like it's got that gel cohesiveness. Yeah, it's the creamy sticky that you get from an egg yolk, you know. For a lot of people who are um, pre-vegan days, and if they're, you know, if you're an ethical vegan and it, you don't have anything wrong with the taste of eggs necessarily, but more just how they're produced, right. um, you know, it's really, it's almost, I would say it's 90% close to the real, you know, traditional thing. It looks fantastic. I got to make my way up there and, and try it. Yeah. If you uh, could use one word to describe how you felt before you were plant-based, what would that be? That's a good question. Oh, my gosh. Um, my gosh. I don't know what to say. One word before I was plant-based plant-based um how about oh my gosh uh i gotta say two words my eyes eyes okay. closed my eyes were closed I, I didn't know i didn't know i didn't know what happened i didn't understand about health or the animals or the environment i just didn't know you know you're you're told blindly that you have to drink milk for calcium and you have to eat meat to be strong for the protein and the iron and that, and that's it. Right. Yeah. How about uh, one word for how you feel now that you are plant-based? I think awake. I think awake is a good word because you just start to understand and know what's going on in this world. It, it really awoke me to, not just what's happening to animals, but also what happens for the production of cheap clothing, you know, sweatshops. So what happens in other industries, what happens in these large corporations that are just, they don't care about the environment. They don't care about what's happening to their workers or the people. They're just, you know, profit, 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 growth, growth, growth. So I think eyes closed and then eyes open or awake are sort of the two things that come to mind. Those are some great words. It's kind of like people get a um, kind of a disassociation with their food. They don't understand where it comes from. Yeah, listen, I, I agree with you. And um, it is tough. It's, it's really difficult to unlearn something. You know, when you learn what happens to animals for food, for entertainment, for animal testing, for, uh, you know, for pets, um, for clothing, you just, you can't unlearn that, you know, it's, it's something that stays with you. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad I learned it and I'm glad I have this platform to be able to inspire change in people and say, listen, you know, if I was the biggest meat eater you'll ever meet, you know, I, I literally ate steak and bacon every day of my life. Hmm. And, And if I can go, you know, I was raw vegan for a year of my life. If I can do that, anyone can. So, 
Yeah, it just takes uh, just takes willpower. Just takes willpower, and <clears throat> I just feel like if people knew, if people really knew what they're doing to themselves on a daily basis in terms of health and what they're consuming, they would change. You know, if they knew about diabetes and heart disease and what it does to you later in life. You know, my father died. He was 79, but he suffered. Mm-hmm. He suffered for the last few years of his life, and he gave himself diabetes, and he just never ate properly. And I would say the last 30 years of his life or 25 years of his life didn't even exercise. So, you know, it's I watched it happen. My mom, my mom passed away just last year. No. Yeah. Um, you know, she, she, or sorry, she passed away five years ago. My dad passed away last year. My mom was 62. You know, it's the same thing. Her heart just stopped. Yeah. So I, I've experienced it and seeing it firsthand and, you know, well being really is, it's not just about being vegan or plant-based. You have to take care of every aspect of your life. You have to be physically fit. You have to be emotionally fit and you also have to be mentally fit. You know, everything has to come together. It really is a sense of everything. And I've been on a podcast, uh, listening to podcasts sort of spree the last six months of my life. And I listened to a great one by Dr. Dean Ornish, who's, you know, mm-hmm. he's one of the pioneer. He's one of the pioneers of all this. He was, he was talking about this in the eighties right. and he, he talks about it now. And he says, there's so many things that are missing from people's lives. Um, well, there's a core set of things that are missing from people's lives and that is health right? You have to eat properly, mm-hmm. exercise, but love, you have to feel love and you have to have a sense of community. You know, if you don't have those things in your life, those sort of four pillars, you're missing out. You're missing out on life and what it is and you're missing out on who you are as a human being. And uh, yeah, that's sort of my esoteric uh, yeah. <laughs> way of speaking. And I can, you know, as someone who's done a lot at a young age already, and I've been up and down the world, the rails of sort of partying too much, and I've protested, and I've had children, and I've opened restaurants, and I think at the end of the day, it really all comes down to you have to have those pillars in your life, and if you don't have those pillars, it doesn't matter what empire you're going to build, that empire will cr- crumble, that empire, that empire will not be there for a long time, so anyone listening anyone that wants to be entrepreneurial, anyone that wants to work for an amazing company and help them grow, I think you have to take care of yourself first, then you can grow all those things. I think that's the most important thing. Those are, uh, those are great words of advice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Doug, so much for uh, taking the time to be with us and um, share your story. Oh, well, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you know, people like you are doing this and you're, you're, you know, I say spreading the gospel, but you know, you're, you're giving, you're giving this a platform that for people to make good change in their lives. And at the end of the day, I think that's what life is about. You have to make change. You have to inspire change and you have to try and um, leave this world a better place than when you entered it. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.